questions for today. The first is from one of our uh, great neurology residents rotating in neuro-ophthalmology, Faiz uh, Romani. Um, Faiz grew up in Kenya, attended medical school in Pakistan, and actually did internal medicine residency in Kenya before coming here to do a neurology residency. He'll be talking to us today about homonymous kinetomyopia. <coughs> Thank you, Adam. So <coughs> I'll start by uh, presenting a case of a 42-year-old right-handed uh, woman who was seen in our clinic. Has a long-standing history of multiple sclerosis diagnosed in 2007. Um, she was band positive at that time. Um, she met McDonald's criteria on MRI. Uh, pretty stable uh, on Avonex. Um, she also has a history of seizures uh, and migraines. Um, in January of this year, she started having this flashing and flickering lights uh, in her left uh, half of her visual fields, um, which was initially concerning for a complex migraine, although she never had headaches at that time. And then this, uh, turned gradually over a few uh, days to uh, hom left homonymous hemianopsia. During this time, she was also having these uh, episodes of altered mental status. Um, and so she saw her um, neurologist who imaged her and treated her with IV solumedrol, uh, thinking that perhaps this was a flare up of her multiple sclerosis. And this did resolve her altered mental status, but she continued to have this uh, persistent um, left homonymous hemianopsia. Of course, she was tapped at that time. She had bumbo puncture, and her CSF was pretty bland, not suggestive of an infection. Um, and so when she came to our clinic, um, her exam, her visual acuity was pretty intact, 2020 on the right, um, 2025 on the left. She did have a small uh, relative afferent pupillary defect on the left, and her visual fields were uh, consistent with left homonymous hemianopia, which we knew. Uh, otherwise, her fundus exam was pretty unremarkable, and she had had an OCT done uh, by an ophthalmologist in outside hospital that looked pretty normal. Her neurologic exam was pretty unremarkable. And so we had a Humphrey visual field, which, as you can see, is pretty uh, convincing for a left homonymous hemianopia. And so we looked at her imaging, and this is her initial MRI that was done um, at the onset of her symptoms, um, especially when she started getting the altered mental status. Um, and as you can see in the top left figure here, this is a diffusion-weighted imaging, and I've tried to contrast it so, I, so that I can illustrate this area of hyperintensity in the right uh, occipital lobe kind of involves the cortex there. Uh, but if you look at the ADC, there is no corresponding darkness there, which would be consistent with a true diffusion restriction. If, if anything, you can see there's some hyperintense uh, ADC there as well. Now, what you see there is her old lesion, which was pr always present in her previous MRIs. So not a true diffusion restriction, but definitely hyperintense on DWI. Um, and then if you look at her T2 flare right here, you can actually see uh, a corresponding area here that looks, again, um, hyp you know, hyperintense uh, on the T2 flare, but no uh, gadolinium enhancement. This is a post-GAD sequence. And so we, when we initially saw this MRI, you know, when you think about sudden onset homonymous from hemianopsia, the first thing that comes to the mind is stroke. Um, and she does have hyperintense there, but it's not a true diffusion restriction. So if we if this MRI was done during her, you know, onset of symptoms, then it should have shown some diffusion restriction or true diffusion restriction, unless this MRI was done maybe a few weeks, two to more than two weeks later, where you have pseudo normalization of the ADC um, and a kind of like a T2 shine through, as we call it. And then because of her history of MS, we also wondered whether this was, um, you know, a flare up of her multiple sclerosis. And you can see diffusion restriction. You can also see similar pictures we can see in, in, on this MRI where you have an, a hyperintense uh, DWI but no corresponding ADC. And the mechanism is basically from vasogenic edema, which looks different from cytotoxic edema that you see in strokes, for example. Um, but then she doesn't have any contrast enhancement uh, on her 
Coast Guard, which is what we would expect with active lesions uh, in MS. And then she has this weird cortical involvement, um, which again is very unusual for demyelinating lesions because they tend to involve the, you know, the white matter rather than the cortex per se. And this was her MRI six months later. And as you can see, the lesion that we saw in the occipital area has more or less resolved. She still has the old uh, flare abnormalities from her old MS. Again, there's no contrast enhancement there. And that this basically effectively rules out any tumors that you would think about uh, because you would still have the lesion there. And so I, I thought it was important to look at the differential diagnosis of uh, homonymous hemianopsias in general and kind of looking at our case. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, vascular lesions, including ischemic strokes, hemorrhagic strokes, and press, and I, sh I should mention press, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, which can present with occipital lesions that look very similar to ours, but they tend to be symmetric and they tend to be bilateral. So again, this was very atypical for press. And she's not on any immunosuppressant that is associated with press, or she's not hypertensive either. So we thought press probably on the differential, but not likely in this case. And then of course, any sort of hematomas in the occipital area, aneurysms, which she, our patient had an MRA of the head and neck, which was negative for any uh, atherosclerotic lesions, uh, significant lesions or any aneurysms for that matter. And of course, autoimmune diseases have been known to cause uh, uh, homonymous heminopsis if they involve the right area. So SLE, there are pretty uh, significant case reports of SLE, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, um, causing uh, homonymous hemianopsias, neurosarcoidosis, uh, PML, um, and then of course our demyelinating disease. So both multiple sclerosis and ADM have been noted to cause uh, homonymous hemianopsis depending on the, where the lesion is. NMO, uh, definitely a differential. Our patient had negative antibodies to NMO. And then tumors, as I mentioned earlier, there's nothing suggestive in our patient. Traumatic brain injury in real life happens to be a pretty uh, common cause of um, homonymous hemianopsis, probably after, uh, after uh, vascular causes. And then any sort of surgery uh, or manipulation of the brain um, involving those areas that would lead to a homonymous hemianopsia. And then, interestingly, seizures can also cause a hem hem homonymous hemianopsia, but seizures tend to cause more of a transient homonymous hemianopsia. In our patients, hemianopsia was more or less permanent. Um, and then complicated migraines, of course. And this patient did have some visual phenomena initially that suggested that this was perhaps a migraine, but then the, the, the defects or the deficits have persisted, which again makes migraines pretty unlikely. Then we have our psychogenic uh, causes of uh, immunopia as well. So I thought it was uh, helpful to look at the general principles of homonymous hemianopias. Um, in, in general, they're caused by retrochiasmal lesions, so any lesions um, basically behind the chiasma. Um, and this is because of the crossed nasal and uncrossed uh, temporal uh, fibers, basically. Um, these visual defects tend to respect midline, so they don't cross over to the other side, as opposed to, for example, glaucoma, where you can have deficits on the other side uh, of the midline. And then in general, depending on where the lesions are, the more posterior you get, the more congruous it gets. Uh, so more anterior, more incongruous, in other words, asymmetric, uh, and more posterior, more congruous. And so we'll start by looking at the optic track lesions, which um, tend to cause incongruous uh, homonymous deficits contralateral to the affected op optic tract. And uh, often you have a contralateral uh, relative afferent pupillary defect, which is what we initially suspected in our patient because our patient has a, a relative afferent pupillary defect on the other side. Uh, vision acuity and color vision are pretty much preserved um, unless there's bilateral involvement or anterior extension to involve the optic nerve or chasm. Um, of course, the disc uh, on the contralateral side shows uh, typically this bow tie atrophy, which I tried to illustrate here. You can see pallor there and pallor there almost looks like a bow tie. Uh, and then in ipsilateral disc, you may see temporal atrophy. And this is um, 
basically pretty typical. Again, causes can be mass lesions like tumors, aneurysms, demyelination, ischemic lesions are usually uncommon. And then we have the lateral geniculate body lesions, which are very interesting because they, they produce this distinct um, sort of hemianopia, hemianopias. Um, and these tend to be almost always vascular. Um, so if you have involvement of the posterior choroidal artery, which is a branch of the PCA, then you have a very highly congruous um, horizontal sectornopia, which is what I've illustrated right there. You can see this really interesting. Uh, and if the anterior choroidal artery is affected, which is a branch of the MCA, uh, then you have what we call a quadruple sectornopia, where you have loss of the upper and the lower um, visual fields, but then you have sparing, sort of a wedge right there. Then, of course, we have temporal lesions uh, or temporal lobe lesions, uh, which tend to affect the optic radiations inferiorly. And so you have the pie in sky appearance, where you have uh, contralateral, superior, incongruous, homonymous quadrantinopia. So, not really truly a hemianopia, but you can have uh, involvement of the inferior visual fields, but it's always, almost always more dense in the superior aspect. Of course, the Myers loop is what is involved there. And then the parietal lesions tend to cause the pie on the floor appearance, which uh, basically means it's a contralateral inferior homonymous quadrantinopia. Again, you can have superior involvement, but it's more dense inferiorly. Uh, interestingly, with parietal lesions, uh, if you check an optokinetic nystagmus, you'll note that it's abnormal, uh, just because the, the pathways for, for the optokinetic nystagmus tend to come into the parietal area and process there. Um, and so the causes, again, tumors, surgery, strokes, and demyelinating disease in both uh, the temporal lobe and parietal lobe lesions. And then occipital lobe lesions, as in our case, uh, have a pretty congruous homonymous hemianopia. Uh, in, case, uh, in cases of stroke uh, causing this hemianopia, you have macular sparing. And that's because there's a dual blood supply to the tip of the occipital lobe from the MCA and PCA. Um, and, and that area tends to get spared um, if one artery is, for example, involved. Um, you can have more atypical um, lesions or visual field defects, including a monocular defect of the temporal crescent only. Again, strokes on the top of the list, press, tumors, traumatic brain injuries, and demyelination appear to be etiologies. And so how do we treat these homonymous hemianopias? Um, of course, we can use optical aids. We can use our simple standard frontal prisms, which tend to displace the images to the ap apex. So uh, you can have them as press-on lenses that you can apply to the hemianopic half of each lens. The only problem is that central vision is affected, so most patients will complain of central scotomas, and that not everybody would like these prisms. And so people have come up with these monocular sectorial prisms, which tend to work better. Uh, and these are prisms that are restricted to the peripheral fields on each side of the hemianopia above and below the pupil. And the prism expands the peripheral, film, uh, peripheral field, of course causes peripheral diplopia, which is what happens in normal people as well. But you have improved walking, improved obstacle avoidance, um, and so improved overall uh, care. And then we have various visual training techniques. Um, some are commercially available. Um, they have different names, but the principles appear to be basically three. We have what we call blind sight retraining, and this is based on the assumption that although you may have a complete hemianopia or homonymous hemianopia, and you, you don't have visual perception on the side of the hemianopia, you can still uh, tell wh whether they're moving objects or obstacles uh, for some reason. Um, and there are various theories that have been put forward. And basically, you can train or retrain people to detect targets in those hemianopic hemifields um, and potentially improve their, uh, their walking and their obstacle avoidance. And then there's the visual exploration training, which basically trains uh, patients to practice their saccades, their large saccades, into the blind fields and therefore detect uh, any objects or obstacles. And then, of course, we have the more easier rehabilitation, the reading rehabilitation, because a lot of these patients have trouble reading um, just because they can't follow those words. 
and the lines. And so you can have them use rulers, for example, to know where, where exactly what line they're reading. You can also train them to read up, up, down, rather than side to side, and that can actually help them as well. So in conclusion, um, it's important to recognize that, that there are different etiologies of homonymous hemianopias. It's not just strokes. Um, and it's important to recognize that demyelinating disease um, is a cause or an important cause of homonymous hemianopia. Um, and lastly, that there are various rehabilitative strategies that are available for treatment. So we should refer these patients for re visual rehab um, as they can benefit from, from this. Thank you. I think they have to go for a driving test again. <coughs> if they can prove that they're safe, uh, you know, they can pass their driving test and should be okay. But you can't just allow them to drive uh, with their hemianopia until they've, been, they've done their driving test again. Dr. Warner. So it's, it's not clear cut. Um, we're, we're leaning more towards MS, um, but it's not 100% um, just because of the atypical features that I mentioned. Um, I think in the event of, for example, if this was stroke, and it does kind of follow a vascular distribution, we've already worked the patient up with vessel imaging, didn't see anything there. Um, and the fact that the lesion appears to have completely disappeared kind of goes against stroke because if you had a significant stroke, you'd see some gliosis or some, some sequelae of the stroke, you know, a few months later. Isn't the case, but it's, it's definitely not 100%. We're not 100% sure about what the etiology is, but it appears to be leaning more towards multiple sclerosis. And this patient's medications were adjusted, um, and she appears to be stable at this point. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I mean, a little controversial because some of the, some of the studies uh, for these commercial programs have been pretty nice and promising, um, wh whereas others have not been that nice and promising. It just depends on what technique is used. There are a few techniques that are considered not very clear cut, uh, especially like the blind sight training, for example, that I mentioned, um, and the visual exploration training is pretty well documented. So. Of course, the reading rehabilitation is also very well documented. I think it's it's worthwhile sending these patients to visual rehab and, and seeing if they can improve. <coughs> oh, sorry. 
think you do have to report. There's that driving form that you have to place where they have to undergo a driving yeah, rehab. And I don't think they have to report as far as I understand. Um, I mean, it's the case with, for example, seizures. You know, if there's no reporting, it's like seizures. I mean, we, yeah. you know, we don't allow them to drive for three months, but we don't, you know, call the DMV and say that this patient has had seizures and can't drive. It's based on the patient himself or herself. It's not drugs. Yes. 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 Yeah, it's it typically patients, and, and I've seen this with patients with seizures, they're like, oh, I, I'm fine with driving, you know, and, and you have to tell them, well, you're fine, but what about the other, you know, pedestrians and drivers? Yeah, they have to be safe, too. All right, thank you.